Hi everyone, welcome to Zoom Church. If I'm an unfamiliar face to you, my name is Emily and it's great to be joining you um, from my home this evening. As we come together as one community who love Jesus and want to know him more and praise his name here tonight, I'm going to read from Psalm 84, 1 to 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and soul cry out for the living God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and soul cry out for the living God. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight ready to praise your name here together, Lord. We just thank you that your courts are beautiful, Lord. Your dwelling place is lovely. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give us a fresh desire tonight to want to be in your courts, to want to be in your dwelling place, Lord. So I just pray that you will draw us near to you, Lord, and that we would really feel you close as we worship you tonight. Amen. Thanks, Luke and Edge. All right, folks, we're going to get, get this started by singing, Better Is One Day. Thousands else 
Father, thank you that we're here. We're uh, we're coming together as a group. We're doing it over the internet, and that's amazing. That's really that's really amazing that we can do that. Thank you that we're blessed with that. Um, and Lord, we ask that you breathe life into this, um, that you open our hearts and you open our minds, and we have a sense of your presence tonight. Amen. Thanks, Luke and Ange. If you have just joined us tonight, my name is Emily and it's great to have you join us for Zoom Church. If you feel comfortable, we would love if you could have your camera on as it's a great way to connect and to see each other's faces. If there are multiple people joining from one Zoom account, it would be great if you could put all your names on the Zoom screen um, name as it's helpful when we go into our social mingle breakout rooms. It's our second week of our John series, A Glimpse of the One and Only, and Jeff will be preaching on Encountering the Light, John 1, 43 to 51. So as a church, we primarily give our tithes and offerings online. If you would like to give, you can find the details on the screen right now, and they are also on the Q Baptist Church website. Benji, my husband, is going to pray over our offerings a little bit later on in the service. So I'm going to hand over to Joey Mock now, and he's going to give a recap, recap and update about how the 12-hour ping pong -thon event went on Friday. Thanks, Joey. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Uh, hey, church. Good to see you all. I'm Josiah, Joey. Um, yeah, I'm just here to talk a little bit about the pong and what happened and how we're going so far. So on Friday from 12 midday to 12 midnight, us resis and a few people that joined online on the Zoom throughout the day continuously played table tennis to uh, raise funds to those who are suffering from human trafficking and slavery. So overall, we had a very successful day. It was a lot of fun. There's a few bad haircuts, a few fundraising goals reached, a lot of table tennis played. And at the moment, we're sitting at $14,271, which is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, the generosity that people have shown over time, so not far away from our ultimate goal of 15,000, which is equivalent to bringing 10 people out of slavery. So how can you still contribute? I know like the event's done, but we're so close. And I think it'd be amazing if we could reach that all together as a church. Um, so Isabella Muir, one of the resis, she has done an incredible art piece that is currently up for auction. And I think uh, only an hour ago, the, uh, the bid got put all the way up to $900, which is Absolutely phenomenal. Um, and that's still going. We'll keep that going until we hit a bit of a dead spot, but it seems like it's still going up and up, which is phenomenal. Uh, you can still also uh, donate on the website. Um, and the incentive is that myself and Xavier Whittingsley, which I'm sure many of you know, are willing to get haircuts uh, <laughs> if we reach 15,000. So we'll be rocking new looks if we can reach the goal. So yeah. We just appreciate your support all the way through from the fundraising events like the bake sale and the trivia night, which are incredible, and the event, the event itself and how everyone has done such a great job um, for such an important cause. So, yeah, that's all I've got. Back to you, Emily. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joey. So two weeks ago as a church, we took a few moments to fill out a form together. We did this because over the last 18 months, we have been traveling through lockdowns and other changes, which has meant we haven't seen each other all together at the same time. This means we need to work really hard to ensure we have a clear picture of who we are as Q Baptists, our giftings, what we are doing, how we can serve and what God is up to among us. So like last time, we're going to take a moment for those who weren't here that week or who missed that segment to fill out this form. Whether you are new or actively involved or a resi or have been attending for a while, we really want to encourage you to participate in this survey. This will really help the church leadership plan and prepare to serve this church community well. 
you will see a QR code, timer and a link. Follow those and fill it out. This week's Q News will also include a link to the survey for those who want more time. See you back here in a moment. Thanks. We are now going to join. Hi everyone, um, my name is Benji and I'm going to be praying for the world. So uh, would you like to all uh, bow your heads and uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a generous God. Thank you that uh, you provide us with all that we need um, and with the the tithes and offerings that we give back to you lord we pray that uh, you would use that for your kingdom and we pray that uh, this money would be used to uh, resource the ministries at q baptist church um, and to grow your church locally um, and that it also resource well the, the different global missions uh, missionaries that we we support overseas um, and that their ministries would continue to be fruitful as well god as we um look ahead over the the coming months as uh, states prepare to come out of lockdown um, and there's different rules and regulations um, and different things that churches will have to uh, adhere to um, and as there's different opinions and um, political views about all the different um, things that are happening, I pray that the church would not become fragmented or um, that there wouldn't be uh, huge disagreements over things, but that we would actually become more unified as a church over the coming months. I pray that we will remember uh, that we are all part of the family of Christ and that we unified through Jesus' death and resurrection and now adoption into God's family. And that would be the main thing that we uh, continue to remember. I pray for Melbourne um, and the rest of Australia that your peace would uh, descend here. Um, whilst there's a lot of anger and frustration from different people directed at different groups of people um, from all aspects of life. We pray that your peace would reign. And I pray that as Christians, we would be your instruments of peace and would be the catalysts of peace uh, in our uh, different cities and areas that we live. We also, as we're instructed, we pray for our politicians, Lord. I pray for Dan Andrews and I pray for um, all the other premiers, and particularly the new New South Wales Premier, Dominic Perrette, pray that um, you would be with them all and that you would grant them wisdom. And we pray for Scott Morrison and all the, the federal government as well, and that they would uh, make decisions that are wise and that um, yeah, are best for Australia. We also pray that um, all the various politicians that are working hard, that they would get rest um, amongst all the chaos at the moment. Lord, um, I want to pray for the pastoral search committee at the moment. Um, I pray that you would give them all wisdom and that uh, they would um, yeah, be able to accurately represent our church and that currently as the pastoral search committee um, goes through um, trying to make a church profile and and understand exactly who we are as a church and, and the needs or the, the pastor that we might um, be looking for. I pray that you would be um, 
fully part of that process and that you would be guiding all the individuals and the team in uh, any decisions that are being made, Lord. We pray all of these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are now going to have a musical item, uh, which has been prepared by Tim Mitchell and Beth Hanlon. So thanks, guys. Hello, Q Baptist Church. Tim and I are going to sing Even When It Hurts, which is written by Hillsong United. Uh, it's a song about uh, coming to God um, and choosing to praise him and find goodness in him, uh, even when things are hard and uh, battles are waging around you, um, you can still find peace in his presence. So we hope it's encouraging.
Even when my time on earth is done Louder than I sing your praise I will only sing your praise Bless you all That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Ebony. I'm going to be doing the Bible reading today. We've got two, um, starting in Genesis and then jumping into John. So we'll be reading Genesis 28, verses 10 to 17, and then John 1, 43 to 51. I'll give you a moment to bring that up in your Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen. Genesis 28, starting at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And we'll jump through to John. Uh, so John 1 Verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decide to, decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the south town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Um, Jeff will come and bring us the message next. Um, join with me as I pray for him. Dear God, thank you for these words that you've written in the Bible for us to come and read. Um, and thank you for all of the work um, that people like Jeff put into um, yeah, putting it all together so that um, we can learn from them. Lord, I pray that you'll open our ears and soften our hearts so that we may be changed um, by your word tonight. And I pray that you will speak through Jeff um, in yeah, a really clear and, and helpful way and that you'll speak to everyone here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, uh, Ebony, for your prayer. And uh, uh, It'll be a fantastic thing if the Lord can um, 
answer those prayers right in these few moments that are coming uh, now. This is a wonderful little passage. It's uh, often glossed over for the more dramatic stories in John's gospel, but there is so much happening here that uh, is relevant to us. We uh, live in a day where the public discourse has shifted, where only a little, little while ago, to defend your faith, you would argue on the grounds uh, of reason and evidence, objectivity, uh, against the, the prevailing discourse, which was materialistically oriented. But now there's been a sudden shift where, where spirituality is the order of the day. And uh, there is so much interest in spirituality in all spheres. And uh, uh, in my sphere, of where my interest in research was in organizational studies, uh, their spirituality props its head, props up all the time as the, the way to think. Uh, it's uh, important then for we as Christians, if we're going to be able to apologize for our faith, we're going to be able to defend our faith, that we can do it uh, within these terms that have been offered to us. Uh, but frequently, I think, as Christians, we, we so glibly talk about to be a Christian like us, we have a relationship with Jesus. End of story. If someone pushes us, well, what does that mean? Well, we're, we can be lost for words. It's very easy that our, our spiritual CV is not kept up to date. But this is a passage here that talks about the four conditions that we must meet or see met if we are to have an encounter with God that we can share with others. These are, if you like, four conditions in this passage that will identify for a first-hand encounter or experience of the Lord Jesus himself. So we pick up this story with uh, in verses 43 to 46 that the story is what's happening in the background is that Jesus uh, is, is eclipsing John. John is passing the baton of prominence to Jesus. And Jesus goes out to therefore start to pick up the teams that will become his 12 disciples. And uh, already Andrew has introduced his brother Simon to Jesus. And then Jesus calls Philip and Philip calls his best mate Nathaniel. Nathaniel, we don't read much more about. He is probably the Bartholomew that we read about in the other Gospels. But Jesus uh, is calling this one and, and Philip tries to explain to his friend that he believes that he has met the Messiah of the Jews and that he's put a hard word on him. And Nathaniel thinks, well, that's, that's amazing because you, we always find it difficult to understand or to comprehend if, if God is doing something he's been promising for centuries and then today's the day he's going to fulfill it. It's just the same as if, if I could give a promise to you that this week Jesus will return. Most likely you would say, oh, yeah. You know, it's just a little bit hard to conceive of something which you've looked forward to for so long, thousands of years, suddenly, suddenly unfolding in your time. But moreover, Nathaniel, he hears that this person is called Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is no, no significant place. It's, a, it's equivalent in our parlance of talking about Jesus of New G. Uh, it's an end of the track location. And, and you just don't expect for uh, uh, this Messiah of the world to come from such a uh, end, of, end of the track sort of town. And so Nathaniel says, uh, you know, <laughs> can anything good come out of New G uh, Nazareth in his situation? Uh, I'm not meaning to knock it. If there's anyone from New G listening tonight, I just want to uh, <laughs> backtrack on that uh, comparison. But the, the, that's, that's the situation. Nathaniel finds this a little bit difficult to swallow. And he's walking towards Jesus. And we pick up the story in, in verse 47. And there we read, if I can only find it in this particular version, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, or in the old versions, in whom there is no guile or cunning, no scheming. Uh, so Nathaniel with Philip is walking towards Jesus. Jesus has got a little entourage around him, 
And he basically cuts off the conversation with them and he says, I want to show you someone. Check out this guy, Nathaniel. This is a blue-blooded Israelite. He's the real deal. There's no trickery with him. In him, inside him, there is no God. Wouldn't it be wonderful that the first time we see the Lord eyeball to eyeball, he can say that about us. But we miss the obvious here that these two people have never met. And yet Jesus is already able to evaluate this guy's character as if he knows him personally. And what Jesus is really saying about Nathaniel, we've got to be careful here. Jesus is not saying Nathaniel is sinless. He's not a saint. But there's something about Nathaniel. He will fail. He does fall. But when he fails and falls, how he rises is different. He does not try to paint himself in a good picture. The Lord gives him a tap on the shoulder of conscience. And Nathaniel takes ownership of what is his stuff. He owns up when God convicts. You see, it's what's happening inside Nathaniel, inside his conscience. Our conscience is sort of like a cave that we retreat to. It's a protected space. We think it's private, but it's very much open to God. But inside our conscience, whenever our conscience embarrasses us, our immediate response like Adam is to cover up. We, we come up with a cover story. And not only that, but then after a while, we work out how to cover up that we've had a cover story. And that becomes our truth. And we live out of that truth. It makes our life very complex when we have that sort of conscience. That's the place of self-talk, the place of fantasy, the place of invention. And the trouble is, is that our Lord has no interest as the truth, as the light. He has no interest in relating to a fantasy. He wants to relate to the real us. So one condition is that if we are going to be people that really have a relationship with Jesus that can speak of an encounter, then like Nathaniel, we have to have the courage to be honest. The difference between a person who is faking it as a Christian and the real deal is what is happening in the conscience. They have the courage to be, to be honest with God when he comes calling, when he is grieved, when he's upset about our performance. But you see, religion is not the way up. Religion compounds this. So, so frequently we might be convinced or convicted that we are cowardly. But we'll come up with a cover story that we're avoiding conflict or we have deep resentment over someone else or even envy. But we paint that as righteous indignation. We, we see ourselves as somehow prophetic in our judgments when, in fact, we're envious of the success of others. Religion really doesn't help at all. It just is part of the cover story, but not Nathaniel. He is a person in whom there is no God. He has worked out that the pain of embarrassment, of conviction, is worth facing. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He has the courage to be honest. That's the first condition if we're going to know God. But then there's something else which is even more peculiar. I wonder if you picked it up as you were reading this passage. Jesus says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And then in verse 48, Nathaniel, in a very guileless, artless response, immediately comes out, well, how do you know me? <laughs> you know, where we met. And Jesus said, oh, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then in verse 49, Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Now, that just strikes me as a little bit over the top, a bit of overreach there. You know, if you look at that literally, they've never met. And Jesus says, oh, to the answer to the question, I don't think we've had the pleasure. Jesus says, oh, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, just put that into our terms. Like, for instance, uh, I'm trying to look at who, I'm, who I've got before me here tonight. Um, if, say, we have, we have uh, 
uh, David Atkinson, and uh, he's got his entourage in Bunnings. He's run into a few mates. And, um, uh, and Peter comes along, and, and, uh, but they haven't met. Let's pretend they haven't met. And uh, David just cuts off conversation. He sees Peter coming and he says, hey, listen, guys, you've got to meet this guy. He's the real deal. True blue Aussie. You won't get one truer than that. Peter says, oh, I don't think I've ever had the pleasure. David says, oh, yes, I have. I saw you in the garden section. I don't think at that point Peter would say, my goodness, you must be divine. Now, Murray might think he is, but that's not the point. It's a little bit over the top to jump from that conclusion. And I don't think that Nathaniel, being the straight up sort of guy he was, would be prone to make such grandiose claims. But what is happening here? Well, I think the only thing we've got to work with is that little phrase under the fig tree. And that little phrase, is uh, crops up in interesting places in the scripture. It, it speaks like the vine. It speaks of Israel itself. It's a symbol. So, but that doesn't get us very far. I saw you in Israel. So what? Uh, it's also a verse that occurs in a lot of scriptures about the end times or the day of the Lord. The Jews always looked for this break in history that was coming down the track where there'd be this new day of blessing. And they looked forward to that. That's what they live for. And uh, for, there are uh, several scriptures, which if I can put my hand on them, that uh, speak of this fact. And uh, some of them are from, for instance, and there's lots of them. We'll, we won't go through them all now, don't worry. But for instance, you would have heard this one from Micah 4.2. Speaking about the day of the Lord, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. Try this one, Zechariah 3. I will remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbour to come under his vine and under his fig tree. And... If Nathaniel heard those words, he might start to say, well, this guy is claiming that this day therein is the day of the Lord. It's that expected breaking in of God's reign. That might make Jesus a prophet, but it doesn't quite get there. I think what is happening here is that Nathaniel starts to, his, his cogs start to grind together. He starts to put two and two together and he thinks, fig tree? What fig tree? You know, the future? No, this is, is this the day of the Lord? Well, I don't know, but my goodness, there's something about this guy that's familiar. I can't put my finger on it. I, I have met him. He, he starts to, and then the penny drops because in, this, in the Jewish study Bibles, if you like, when they read the Bible, they often read it, with Talmud down the side, that is interpretation, often very spiritualistic interpretation. And when you got to those passages like Micah and two and or four and uh, Zechariah three, when you got to the fig tree to explain it, they'd spiritualize and they'd say, well, in the day of the Lord, the Jewish man will be able to spend all day under his fig tree meditating upon the law. Won't that be a great thing? So understand fig tree as a euphemism for devotional life. Now you plug and play that into Nathaniel's head. And as the cogs grind, he says, I've met this person, I know this guy. And he knows that he's had an experience in his prayer life where God has got through to him that Nathaniel, you're not perfect, but you're okay. You're godless. And God has been able to speak to him at that level. And Nathaniel remembers that. And then he sees this person and he hears that voice and he knows who it is. It is the Lord God himself, the one he has met. We can only understand his experience if we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is not something that we just salute as the flag of orthodoxy. 
and we, we get our Boy Scout stamps for doing that and we work out that we're not heretics like the Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe in the Trinity. It's not about that. The Holy Trinity is about how it's possible that someone like you and me can actually know God at all. Now, there's a slide which I think we have of, uh, that might help, might, might obscure. But if I asked anyone in this uh, viewing screen tonight, uh, what's the doctrine of the Trinity? I'm sure most of us would just prattle off, well, it's about the fact that God is both three and one at the same time. That uh, all three persons of the Trinity are equally God always. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and we know that, well, the first person of the Trinity is the Father. Uh, and the second person is the Son, and the third person of the Trinity is the Spirit. There are three centers of consciousness in God. Now, if we're thinking about knowing God, then it's impossible to know God if he does not want to communicate. He holds the cards of communication, all of them. We can't demand it. We can't sense it. We read about that last week. It's not innate in us to know God. But because he is a Trinity, he is he could say, he could describe the Trinity in terms of revelation, that the Father's role, the first person's role, is to be the person who decides that there will be revelation. He is the revealer. Who and where and when, that's his business. And when God peels back the curtain to reveal himself, the one who is revealed is the second person of the Trinity. That's what he is. He is the Logos, the speech of God. And that's who Jesus was. And, and, but that one is not at the behest of those who see him. We don't control that. God still retains control. He has sovereignty over this. And the third person is the revealing one who makes Jesus known, who gives eyes to the blind, who enables us to see the God who is revealed. That's really the doctrine of the Trinity. It's about the fact that God is at the same time, sovereign and accessible and knowable. If it wasn't, God wasn't for that, then we would be like all the mystics in the world. We'd be speaking about mysteries, about the unknowable. And I believe that there is too much talk about mystery in Christianity today, and it doesn't come from Jesus or the scriptures. It comes from a history that has been tainted by the world. We don't contemplate an unknown God, but we contemplate Jesus Christ. You know, the only God we know and the only thing we'll know about God is Jesus. He is the revealed one. The Holy Spirit reveals him. You cannot know the Holy Spirit. You can know that he has been with you because you know Jesus. Anyone who says they know God will be able to describe Jesus and name him. He is the revealed one, no one else. The Spirit reveals Jesus. We'll see much more of that in later chapters in John. So if we're going to have a firsthand experience, we've got to realize that his triune shape permits it. Otherwise, it would be impossible. We are so fortunate that God is put together that way. His structure makes it possible. Without this, any encounter is wishful thinking. We come into verse 49, and you notice the same thing in that same verse. He says, you are the son of God. You are Israel's king. Now, that is a very important few little verse, words there. You are Israel's king. In other words, he not only, Nathaniel not only identifies the Jesus of his spiritual experience with the flesh and blood figure standing there before him. But he identifies that person who stands there now with the very history of God's dealing with Israel. He is their real king, despite all. He is the, the one that David was only a figure of. This is the king par excellence. That's an astonishing thing to say, but that's the difference between ourselves and pantheism and mysticism of the rest of the world of religion is that we have a God who has decided not only to specially reveal himself to be special revelation in Jesus, but to specially reveal himself in a process 
over history, through time. Now, if God decides to reveal himself that way, if I really want to know this God, then I should appreciate what he's given by virtue of making me, giving me a ringside seat on all that history of Israel. And that then flows into his history of the incarnate son and the apostolic record that follows that. It's all the one special revelation. There are two forms of special revelation, if you like. Years ago, I was uh, down in Melbourne when I was living uh, in um, other places and uh, I decided to come down and catch up with the folks and uh, there was a bookshop in Box Hill that I used to always go to. It was a terrific bookshop and I used to enjoy it. It was next door to the Lutheran Church. I think uh, the Lutheran Church in Box Hill had set it up. And uh, this particular day, I pulled up and was about to spend my heart in in, in this uh, particular bookshop. And I got out and lo and behold, the bookshop wasn't there. And I thought maybe they've shifted somewhere else in Box Hill Shopping Centre. And I went into the foyer of the Lutheran Church and there was a bit of a kerfuffle happening there. And there was this lady who was uh, obviously um, speaking with a very clipped Arabic accent. And uh, and, and I, I could see an argument was going on between her and the, the administrators who were trying to deal with her predicament. And I put my bib in and I just said, look, what, what's the business here? What's going on? And uh, they couldn't understand what she was saying. It was pretty obvious that she wanted to buy a Bible, but the bookshop had disappeared. We both had the same problem. And uh, I got talking to her and I said, I know where I can buy a Bible in your tongue, where we can get one. It's not far away. And we started talking. And I said, by the way, why do you want a Bible? And I was a little bit blown away by her response. She was a card-carrying Sunni Muslim. But since she'd been in Australia, she'd started to have nightmares. And I said, what are they about? What are they about? She, she said to me these words, every night I see your prophet and every night he tells me to get his book. Now, that's the sort of thing that God the Holy Spirit is doing. He's revealing Christ, but he wants to direct us to his book because that's where we'll have the cognizance to understand what he's trying to do in our life. That's how salvation comes about. That's special revelation for you. And God is doing that on our doorstep. None of us would be a Christian if somehow we had not come in contact with the story that begins in Israel and ends in the new Israel. Come. His story presents him. And that's the nature of it. I find it astonishing with so many Christians who would love to have a close, cuddly relationship with Jesus, but they've got no interest in the scriptures. And that just doesn't make sense. You know, I, I think of a, another story when I was a, a young fellow at university at Monash many years ago. I wasn't exactly the best student, but I studied with a bunch of mates. We we're all doing uh, economic, economic statistics at this time. And we had this table that we'd reserved underneath the staircase in the main library. We we're there every day. But then over a period of time, something strange happened. A couple of persons of the opposite gender cast out to sit at our table. And they were from a different course. And, and they started to get rather palsy wellsy with various ones. And one day, out of the blue, and this was not my current common experience, this particular young woman said to me, um, would you like to go and have a coffee? And I said, well, if you're paying, I'll be in it. <laughs> and uh, so we headed off to a thing called the Small Calf, which was a, a terrible grotty calf full of, you know, whatever people were smoking. And, uh, and, and she, delightful person, bought me a, I actually wanted a hot chocolate, I remember now, because she got free marshmallows with that. And we went and sat down and uh, we're sitting and I was having my big mug of marshmallow. And she said, now, tell me about yourself. And I said, well, being an artist, I needed no invitation. And so I began to paint a good picture of myself. And I started telling her about, uh, you know, what my ambitions were and the sporting clubs I was part of and where we played and what I enjoyed and what happened last Saturday. And all of a sudden, she cut right across that. You know what she said? She said the most stupid thing I'd ever heard. She said, I'm not interested in all that stuff. I just want to know you. <laughs> And right at that moment, I knew that we were not cosmically compatible. There was no chemistry there. You see, I 
That my drama is myself. That's where I've been. Ah, there's not another me somewhere else that's just been idle sitting by that you can get to know. The, the real God has been active and living in Israel's history. If you want to know him, you've got to read his book. Make it your own. That's the nature of it. And if you want to, I suggest there are four Ps that could change your reading. You've got to read the Bible, not just for information about Israel or about God. You've got to read the Bible for encountering God. And so I'd suggest if you've got nothing better to do when you read, don't just skim read, but read, God, please show me your presence. The things that are surprises. Every day I read something I haven't seen before. I've just never noticed. Or show me your priorities. Or surface your principles. When you know someone's principles, you know their core. And you'll find yourself getting closer to him. But above all, I pray, Lord, I give you permission to show me myself through this word. That is radical, and it will be disturbing, but it will be refreshing. You know, the writer of the Hebrews has that wonderful verse, which I just leave with you. The, he says, for the word of God, and this is how we make sense of this, for the word of God, it's not just information. It's not just an objective block of words. The word of God is living and active. In other words, there is a union between Jesus, the revealed and, and this history of Israel, they have joined themselves by the work of the Holy Spirit. He's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, it, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He can show me all the cover stories I've made over the years and help me strip back the proud flesh of fiction and discover who he made me. That's the beauty of the word of God. The Holy Spirit is both the inspirer of the word of God, but he's also the illuminator of the reader of the word of God. We forget that if we don't use that instrument. He's been working on that work for 5,000 years. <laughs> Give him credit. Give him time. Well, we come to the end of this passage. And uh, Nathaniel is just blown. His fuse box is blown. He's got to reappraise everything he's ever thought about God. He's now got a Trinitarian rough idea of how God is put together and who Jesus is. But then Jesus sees his face and probably his draw, jaw was on the ground. And he says to Nathaniel, and then he switches his target. You notice this in 50 and 51? Jesus says, you think this is something? You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You think that's something? You'll see greater things than that. And then he added, and turning to the crowd, he now changes the word you, a different word in his language, from the singular to the plural. He addresses the crowd of admirers. And he says, very truly, I tell you, when we, if we were Southern Americans, we'd say, I'm telling you all, I'm telling all of you, this is good for all of you, not just Nathaniel. You all will see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, where have you heard those words before recently? Obviously, that's from the first reading. It's a story of Jacob where he has the vision that he's just put his head down by the sacred side of the ladder of heaven. And he has that dream of the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And the angel of the Lord comes down that ladder and speaks to him. That angel was our Lord before time. And then the ladder is gone. It's a remarkable story, but Jesus is playing that. I wonder even if that was the very passage that Jesus spoke to Nathaniel about it months earlier or whenever it was that he had that experience. I've got to wonder whether 
Nathaniel, who has no guile, was reading about the story of Jacob, who was full of guile, until he wrestled. Now that one becomes Israel. God transforms him. So first of all, I think we need to realize this passage is telling us that we all can have an experience like Nathaniel. This isn't reserved for special people or for elites. Don't think that you're just an average Christian and you've got to look up and hear great stories about others. God has a great story in which he wants to make you a key character. And then he says, you all will see heaven's open. In other words, they couldn't do it at this time because Jesus himself had not finished his work and made it possible to give them that sort of experience. That only comes through dealing with sin. It's only sin that separates a holy God from his people. And he had to deal with that at Calvary. And that's confirmed by the resurrection. And then the blessing falls out that he's speaking about. In their day, it was future. They couldn't experience in those months when Jesus walked the earth. They were uh, a different paradigm of a believer to us. But we live this side and we are so fortunate. Do you realize how fortunate you are to live this side, Calvary? where now you can have an experience that is as rich and real as any of the greats that you read about in the Bible anyway. Y'all will see heaven open and the angel of God, maybe not literally exactly like this, but descending and ascending to heaven. You notice the last words, upon the Son of Man. Upon the Son of Man. The Son of Man has changed position from being in heaven and making a commando raid into earth and then returning. He has now become the ladder. In other words, Jesus has become the intermediary between this grotty fallen world and my grotty fallen cave of conscience and heaven. And he has made that a permanent link. He has linked me up through himself. That revealed one is my access to glory now. And he's placed the feet of that ladder. ladder. Where has he placed it? He's placed the feet of that ladder right in my conscience cave. So he can come in at any time and he'll see this dimly lit game of <laughs> cave of games and fiction and fear. And you know what he says? He comes with a new message that he couldn't speak in this time. He doesn't come and say, Jeff, you're doing okay. That's close to guileless. He says, Jeff, you're guiltless. I've taken away all that you could be afraid of. There is no need to be embarrassed or fearful here. Let's not play Adam's game one more time. No hiding in the garden here. Guiltless. We can stand before God. We can talk about our sin. We can talk about our fear. We can address our weakness and he won't rub our noses in it. It's been dealt with, but we can find solutions, hope. That's the nature of this. In other words, the definition of a sacred site has changed forever. Tomorrow morning, if that's your time with God, you might go to the local park and sit there with your Bible. And people will go past you and back and forth, and they think it's someone, some woman, some young man reading a book. It's not. It's the gateway to heaven. You have become the sacred site, the temple of God. Nothing less. Appreciate the meaning of this moment, not just the moment in history post-Calvary, but that moment that you have with him. He is all he is. He is giving you his attention and he's offering you a chance to dialogue with the Son of Man. The only God gives you his total attention. There will be no accidents in terms of what you read if you read with that understanding. I'd invite you, like the psalmist, when you're there with 
with your scriptures before you go much further. That like Jacob, you would pray that God would awaken you from your slumber. And you'd say to yourself these words. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I do know it. How awesome is this place? This mundane place is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Search me, O God. Try my heart. See if there be a wicked way in me. Amen. Thank you, Luke. Thanks for that message, Jeff. We're going to respond to that by singing uh, Transfiguration now.
your glory that cannot be unseen I am changed and changing still as I look upon you Lord and believe now I know Thank you so much, Jeff. What an amazing message. And thank you to Luke and Ange. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, God. You want to know us, relate to us, and communicate with us. You really do want us to encounter you. Thank you for the Trinity and that it actually allows us to encounter you. Father, give us a fresh hunger for the truth of your word. That's where we find you. Help us to pray bold prayers that lead us closer to you. Like Nathaniel, give us the courage to be honest with you this week, God. Help us to be the real deal with you. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he has paved a way for us to communicate with you. And for that, we are thankful. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, that concludes our service today. So if you want to know more about Jesus, um, chat to someone about what you've heard tonight, or if you were struggling, please reach out and contact the church. And you can do this through the church website where you will find contact information. So now's the time where we encourage you to stay around and join a supper group and to continue our community online tonight. So this concludes our service. We will see you next week. Take care, church.